and listen. Now, live from Chicago, the Hal Sparks radio program mega worldwide. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. Hal Sparks, actor, comedian, and multimedia personality. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Hal Sparks. All right, let's do this. Okay, Johnny Million, welcome to the show. How you doing this morning? How you doing, buddy? Hal What's going Sparks. on? Hal Sparks. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a crazy day. There's lots going on. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes it helps us if we, uh, you know, in to get a little perspective, you know, to get a little, uh, yeah, to to look at uh, the state of the world and and kind of you know recognize where you know perhaps on some levels we, uh, you know, we we definitely have room to grow as a country always. Always and forever, we can always get better. That's the thing. It's like uh, Biden says, you know, if there's a word that defines uh, America, it's possibilities. It's it's possible that we'll get better, and it's possible that we won't. But the um, as an ongoing endeavor, um, I Please think we're, Mia Moore. we're doing we're doing all right most of the time. We are, yeah, and so is Lisa Mia Moore with her super chats. She's oh, ridiculous. Dear. Thank you so much. I don't, uh, by the way, in the new setup, because I had to salvage my entire setup, I can't see any of that stuff. So you're in charge of that today until I All get right. that ready. So if I interrupt with praise from them, it's on them. So That's just right. Keep your trap shut. Don't give us any super chats. Quit it. Quit saying nice things. It's not helping. Not helping. <laughs> um, so th- uh, let's, let's just, let's just start, you know, obviously we're going to, we'll discuss the Ukraine Russia conflict. In you know, in the second hour when Philip joins us, he was on yesterday because uh, Wednesday I had a complete flame out on my morning live stream because of issues. And um, for the most part, um, you know, it, it would be one of those situations where if the spring offensive wasn't coming up, there's an argument that we wouldn't have that much to talk about that we didn't talk about yesterday. But so much is changing so fast right there, uh, right now, that there will be a lot. <laughs> and thank you, Hal Vickery. Hal Vickery gives us a uh, super chat in spite of the nice things that he can't say. Oh, that's good. Well, I, I it, it, very seldom do people pay to uh, shut themselves up. It's a, it, that's I think right. it's, so we, it's a, quite frankly, it. a, a level of growth I will never show. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So um, uh, right now, I don't know. How much you're aware of the the current Sudan situation? No, have nothing. you been following this? Okay, so last few days, um, there uh, there was an attempt at a ceasefire. There's been an ongoing civil war in Sudan for a very long time, and uh, in 2011, uh, there was uh, you know this basically a, a dictator for life type takeover, and then in 2019, um, there was it, in many ways. It's sort of the height of the Abrams Accord stuff that Trump was doing because the Sudan was going to be was one of the countries on the list that was going to happen very quickly. It's going to be perfect. <sighs> it's been an ongoing civil war for decades, um, at, which, by the way, resulted in Sudan becoming Sudan and South Sudan, which are two separate countries. And, oh and so bad in the country of Sudan that the, that South Sudan and this is kind of fascinating. So South Sudan voted to separate themselves from Sudan. Um, And by 98%, like the public said, yeah, 98%, we're with you, out. We don't want any part of that. It's a mess. Mm. And Sudan is, South Sudan is now landlocked because of that. They gave up coastal area. They gave up access to the ocean in that separation. That's how bad, do do you have any idea how bad things have to be in an African country for you to give up coastline. Yeah, Good Lord. So, yeah. So right now there's this, uh, there are two guys um, that, that will that we'll bring you up to speed as quickly as we can. There's uh, Al, uh, Al Bar- Barhan, uh, who's the general of the military and he runs the army. And then there's this guy who everybody calls Hemeti and he runs the, the, the like, well, they call it like the support force. It's really the the rapid support force. It seems more like a rapid strike force, if you ask me. You know, there's I I like the idea of support, and I'm sure it it made a, a lot of international um, 
you know, NGOs and other groups very comfortable when they name that group the rapid support group when it's indeed a rapid strike group, uh, strike force. Anyways, so oh, of civil wars, there have been, you know, myriad throughout the centuries. No, no continent is immune um, and the definition of whether they're, you know, civil or not being that they are the same people is the only thing that kind of keeps the, the Native American tribal wars, for example, being viewed as, uh, as, as civil wars because they are mm -hmm. effectively separate tribes. But the idea is that they share the same land or they did at one point and then they stopped, which I think is kind of the kind of classical pre nation state, pre, you know, uh, international law idea of what a uh, civil war was anyways Hatfield McCoy type stuff um I suppose would qualify as well on a smaller scale yeah. right this has a lot I mean, this is a lot closer to a Hatfield and McCoy situation because these two guys were uh you know basically first position second position in the military that took over that ousted the dictator uh there was a the dictator was ousted i'm giving you the broad strokes because we got to catch up but the dictator right. was ousted there was a movement towards democracy there has been one the people themselves want it they kind of as bad as south sudan has it on so many levels they at least envy that aspect that there's some element of that there um but these two guys have effectively they were put sort of in charge or took charge to guarantee uh you know control of the country until a interim democratic leadership could be appointed, which I, I know what you're thinking, as am I. You don't appoint democratic leadership. You yeah. elect them. This is different. And you're absolutely right. And it is exactly why it failed. And these guys, um, and this will tie into some of the stuff we're dealing with as far as uh, Russia and Ukraine as well, in that... Um, the question always comes in, once you get power in a situation like that, are you willing or able or, uh, you know, averse to giving it up? Are, are you going to have a George Washington moment where you go, all right, you know what? I'm tapping out. We don't need a longtime leader. I'm going back to being a farmer. You guys, you know, pick somebody every four years, which is great <laughs> and rare. But in the case of a country like this, the your reasoning for why you would give up that power because of the power balance in that country is a lot is a lot thinner. There's a lot fewer reasons why you would step down in that situation because sure. there's too much upside and too much downside. You know, upside you're a rich dictator who can basically kill any one of your rivals. Downside you might be at the at, at you know, on the receiving end of some disgruntled citizens at a certain point. And you'll only have what semblance of law exists to protect you. So these guys aren't in a big hurry. But you would think, to some degree, that these guys, uh, that uh, Al-Bohan and, um, and Hamedi would, you know, be kind of comfortable in their number one, number two position. That eventually the number one guy might find himself being the military leader who becomes the president and his number two becomes the head of the military or something like that. Well, you would think that. Um, if a, there wasn't decades of civil war that you have to deal with on, you know, on top of, you know, the tribal strife and all kinds of other stuff, which they, you know, people can work through, they can figure it out, but there's a big thumb on the scale in that Hameti, who's the lower, you know, power guy, he's running the kind of what would effectively be the rebel forces, except they are technically part of the government is aligned with, uh, a Syrian military leader who is funded by Russia and is supported by the Wagner group. And four days before the like the latest big attack that's led to all the bloodshed, a, a Russian airplane, like an SU-42, I believe it was, landed in, in Syria or at the Syrian, yeah, just across the border in Syria. Uh, and in, interestingly enough, and this is all over social media throughout the Middle East, this plane took off from uh, this base. This Russian plane flew in, uh, landed there, took off, flew into Sudan, into Khartoum, the capital, and dropped off a bunch of stuff and then flew out. And the Hameti forces, the 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 support forces, 
um, suddenly had a lot of ammunition, suddenly had a lot of weapons, and suddenly had a lot of Wagner support. But why? Why, Johnny Million? Why? Why? Why Sudan? Uh, 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 Sudan uh, I don't know. Could it I, be? I, but I, do I need to riff long enough for you to take a sip of <laughs> your delicious beverage? Nope. Um, I was genuinely asking, um, would it be something like they care about the governance of Sudan? Oh, it's definitely altruistic. Yeah, you think it's a charity thing on there? It's a, it's yeah. the, yeah, the Wagner the greater good kind of vibe that you get. Yeah, sure, total NGO. Um, it's because they've been um, trucking and training out gold out of the uh, western part of Sudan nonstop during the conflict, and Hameti basically seems to have an agreement with the Wagner Group and the Russians that he will effectively continue the chaos long enough for them to bug out with some of that stuff as long as he gets some. Now, um, the gold? Yeah, lots and lots of it. Hmm. Now they they, you know, Sudan is a very impoverished country. Um the the gold they process and export for sale is, you know, is a highly ma manipulated, highly corrupt practice. It's one of the reasons why they can, it's basically a, a bank robbery that's going on with the Wagner Group and the Russians. It's one of the reasons why, and Prigozhin might be simply, you know, sort of filling his bank account in his attempt to kill Putin at some point. It, it could be that shady because it's that kind of situation. Well, um, when we come back, there has been, there have been 400 people as of current, estimates killed in Sudan, including um, an American. And the White House is in the process of arranging for an evacuation of all U.S. embassy staff and any Americans Ooh. who want to bug out. It's that bad. We'll be back right after this. It's the House Park Radio Program, Mega Worldwide. You're locked into the House Parks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide. So I, um, in in the, um, in in an attempt to try and stabilize what's going on in Sudan right now, the U.S. has formed what's called the Quad for Sudan, which is the U.S., the U.K., Saudi Arabia, and uh, the UAE, and um, and Sudan being largely Sunni Muslim, um, and the this this sort of back and forth. Between you know dealing with the 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 Wagner Group and others transporting Sudanese fighters to Yemen to fight on behalf of the Houthis in Yemen and and the idea that some of the reason why this is popping off is because the Saudi Arabia and the and the governing body of Yemen who is not the Houthi rebels the Houthi rebels are in the north closer to the border of of. You know, the, the Yemen war is really about this border area. It's very much like in a much bigger scale. It's like the Moldovan region between, you know, Ukraine and Moldova that Russia wants. It's the Houthis are like the Russians in that group, in that section. Okay. They want and then they want to spread both directions is the idea. And and there's been a lot of pushback or whatever. But they, like as soon as that started to be the I guess the Saudis felt like they couldn't ever just bash right through it because they would just like anybody who gets involved in a conflict and don't ask me how I know this as an American, but um, oftentimes if you're not very careful in a situation, you can make more enemies and people who blame you for the, the conflict, even if you were there to help initially. So the Saudis found that out the hard way in, in their relation with the Yemeni government and in, you know, in sort of the brokered talks around Iran and all that stuff that Iraq has been doing and the UN did that China got credit for a few, you know, a month or so ago. The the fighters that were Sudanese that were siphoned down there have started to return, I guess, which has also heightened the tensions initially. But the most bizarre thing about this entire situation, and again, it is a it is breaking news at the current. It is a big deal. In any other situation where there wasn't something like the Ukraine war going on, this would be the primary news. This is you know, okay. this is uh, Serbo Croatian Kosovo kind of stuff. This is this is absolutely you know, or or Arab Spring or you know Libya and Gaddafi level stuff as far as the 
the conflict. It's been going on for a long time, but this current dust up is pretty is extremely bad. There are jet fighters bombing cities. It's a it's it, you know, and it's so off the radar for a lot of people. But it boils down to the personal relationship between this Al Burhan guy and Hameti. Like they are at one point, there are they're across the board. This is from Al Jazeera, UN, New York Times, you know, various disparate groups of how this most recent fight started is because these guys who were working together to shepherd through, in theory, a, a democratic system in in Sudan got mad at each other over something. Somebody was stepping on somebody's toes. Obviously, the Hamedi guy thought he was going to be sort of the head of the military and everybody would just move up the ladder and he wouldn't be the number one guy. But he wanted, But there was a conversation about he shouldn't have a back channel to the civilian government once it's set up because that's al Burhan's job as the head of the army. And so he was like, no, I want a red phone too, was basically it. And they stopped talking to each other. This is from uh, Axios's reading of it, but this is last week. The Sudanese source said the Quad for Sudan, which includes U.S., U.K., Saudi Arabia, and UAE, gave both sides a proposal. We were almost there. Um, uh, Blinken called Al Burhan and urged him to resolve the final sticking point between them, reminding him of his commitment. But by then, the talks between the two generals had fallen apart, and both sides began to prepare for an armed confrontation. Um, this is uh, the yeah the. This is the disagreement was centered on the military chain of command that would what, what it would look like in civilian led Sudan, a senior U.S. official and Sudanese source told Axios. While Al Burhan wanted to be the top military figure and the only one to report directly to the civilian government, Hamedi demanded to have his own direct channel to civilian leaders without having to go through the commander of the military, the senior U.S. official. That's what this is all about. This is about uh, that foreign people have died in the last few days. They couldn't even hold a ceasefire during uh, the um, the Eid uh, religious holiday. And there is no reason to expect that this will, that the truce, you know, it, it, it failed to start with and why this is going to stop anytime soon. Uh, right now, it is, a, it is a matter of just, we're in a refugee situation where people who had come from, you know, surrounding countries into Sudan are now running out. Um, and it will break over the next couple of, uh, you know, few days in the next week or so. The, like, like I said, the, the U.S., the U.K., the U.A.E., and Saudi Arabia are all trying to tamp down the violence and get it settled again. Mm. But in the middle of all this, in throwing a monkey wrench in the entire system is arms shipments from the Russians flown in directly from, uh, you know, I'll... Bashar al-Assad's Syria and a and a governor who uh, believes that ultimately the result of this will be a split just like last time where Su we have a South Sudan and then Sudan becomes East and West Sudan with the West being the valuable part as far as shipping and the uh or sorry the East being the valuable part as far as shipping and supplies and other stuff, and the East being valuable for simply its mineral rights and the gold, which is the part that Russia and this warlord in uh, in Western uh, Eastern Syria wants to take over. Um, there is, and I, when I talk about the China issue with you know with folks on my regular live stream, and we discussed it here a few times, there is a war over who is going to carve up Africa. And the oh. the aversion of, you know, and and anger towards, and especially in the case of con companies like Exxon and others, the the absolutely reasonable aversion to, you know, inter multinational corporations, US and UK centered ones like BP and the like, especially around oil and and the damage they've done in Africa and our kind of collective shame and aggravation at it, and their attempts to greenwash themselves as they tran you know, transfer into being renewable transmission companies as opposed to you know, transmitting energy from one place to another as opposed to digging it up out of the ground and setting fire to it. Um, the, our aversion to that is keeping us five steps back from our involvement in Africa because the, the idea is it's always imperialism. If we go there, 
if we send if UN troops are there or US troops are there, the only reason we're there is so that we can set up a Starbucks and and kill everybody. And because that's the generalized feeling, it is. I mean, look at look at Carlin's <laughs> that is an bit. Awful business plan, by the way. It's terrible. It doesn't work very well Setting at all. Who are you going to sell the coffee and then to? Killing everybody. Yep. Yeah. Just yeah. Well, and moving your own people in is the idea, or what have you, or like a new version of South Africa. Um, the problem with that feeling is is that while things that America have done has done in the past, and especially I would argue UK and and BP or multinational corporations in the past have done, and our reliance on oil has made us kind of tiptoe backwards from going after them as much as we could. Because again, one of the reasons why the BP head after the uh, the Gulf oil spill said he just wants his life back and he doesn't know what the big deal is, is because the head of Exxon, um, you know, hangs out with that dude, and Exxon dumped that amount of oil into the Nile and the Congo every year, forever. So he's like, what? I don't know. It's a giant body of water. What's the big deal? That's that's why he feels that way because his his direct competitors have been poisoning you know African rivers and streams for decades. That said, because of our you know reticence post Iraq War, post Vietnam, and to pick your poison. Um, the two groups that are stepping in in Africa the most are the Chinese and the Russians. And in the case of the Russians, it's almost solely the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group is a private military organization, and they, but they work in lockstep with the with the Russian government. And they are sort of they sort of clear the brush. They come in and make the the ground ripe and desperate for Russia to seed whatever industry or take what they want. And that's it's a it's been horrifyingly scary. And again, I've referenced this before, but the but the stories of what the Wagner group did in Somalia and Sierra Leone and other places to clear the way for their, you know, the mineral stuff that they needed is some of the most horrifying tales of human depravity since I would argue uh, the Holocaust and the rape of Nanjing. Oh, it is on scale with that kind of behavior. It is not on volume, which is partly why it's gone by in the background. The other part is, of course, the, the combination of the Chinese debt trap, which is the BRI. There, you know, that um, in the case of when the IMF or uh, the, the US through our foreign aid or anybody else, when we pay to help a country do infrastructure, we loan them money. Absolutely, we expect to be paid back with interest at some point because that's the point sure. of a loan. And a lot of times we've restructured those loans so many times that they're almost useless. However, at no point, even when we bring in, like we go, all right, we'll set up a system for you or help set up a system for you, but we've got to have some oversight on the ground to make sure that's where it goes. We can't just, we're not just going to give you a blank check because it always ends up someplace terrible. So we're going to send some engineers or you know, that kind of stuff in to help you make sure that as basically audit the loan in that regard to make sure it, you know, cause it's going to be continuing ongoing payments cause it's in our budget. That way we budgeted it out over five years or what have you. Um, the Chinese don't do that. They loan the money and then they, in, they have Chinese contractors and Chinese employees and Chinese citizens enter the country and build it and pay themselves to do the work. Then they leave. And the impact on the local economy uh, is terrible because they end up indebted with a bridge that is half built uh, by people who never made it, never made any money that they were intending to keep in the country. And this is a constant ongoing problem. We got to take a break. We'll be back right after this. It's the House Parks Radio program, Mega Worldwide on WCPT Radio, Chicago's Progressive Talk. <laughs> 